without saying that, of course, we do have that shadow. We have to acknowledge it. That's the biggest problem of the world today is that people refuse to do that. They rather project their shadow on the third world or on an enemy over there or any three-headed monsters that the government throws up to be rattling the gates of our security. You know, they know how to work with us. They know how to get us to project our own dark selves onto whoever the nemesis is for the particular season, you know, that these politicians want us, want to bring it up. It's understandable why people become petty tyrants is because, you see, they're, in a one way, it's born out of a virtue. They want power. They, uh, and, and because power has replaced love. It's like I talk about this in an article I've got called Weapons of Mass Destruction Found. When the person has been so mutilated and removed from their actual natural, organic, biological, spiritual, and moral power, a uh, moral, you know, inward power, they're going to crave the outward power that their parents had over them, that the teachers and the politicians and the priests have over them. They're going to identify with that. And some may take that power up, like those who go and commit corporate crime, for instance, you know, the stroke of a pen. The greatest crime that's done in this world isn't done with guns and weapons, or even with technology for that matter. It's done with a pen. It's done look with at, the Look bank. at Ber Bernie Madoff. Look what he did. Yeah. You know? and, so, and then we might have a person who takes that up for a while before they regain their senses. Because the artificially deprived man, in one way, is not his own being. And of course he's going to go wherever he thinks the power and the success and the status is. You know, and, and so in some ways it's lamentable, but it's because people are looking for that in inherent sense of command and power over their own being. And because it's displaced into the world and then it takes the form of having power over other people. And the more desensitized you are and the more you know, artificialized you are within yourself, you are, as I said before, you're hardly going to treat other people with humanness. My God, when you go in to get served at a place today, you can barely get a smile. You can barely get eye contact with people anymore. You know what I mean? Well, how, mu yeah, how much is a game for them? Um, it's, it's, it's not a game in its ultimate sense, but of course, it, it, like uh, Sidney Webb and, and others, you know, they've described it as a game because the rules are like a game. And remember, we're part of that game. We are, we are also pawns on that geopolitical board. And if we don't occupy the white squares of knowledge, somebody else will. You know, they want us on the black squares of ignorance, but we have the perfect right. And that's what my work emphasizes a lot, you know, uh, is to step on to those white squares of knowledge and get informed about what's going on, not in fear, but as, as in a very proactive way, because we are many, they are few, and they are the ones who are truly in fear. A lot of people talk about, you know, we should be in fear of them, but as a matter of fact, they are in desperate, deadly fear of us, and that's why they have to use control, have to use power, and have to bring in their new world orders to keep everybody, you know, under the gun. And if they can't do it in one way, they'll do it pharmacologically, uh, and they'll do it technologically, you know. And, of course, their old agenda, this is from the time of Bacon and Thomas Hobbes and Malthus. Uh, we, you talked earlier about the splitting of, of the, the, the masters are divided into the two camps, and we talked about that. One other anecdote about that is that the men who worried that mankind might rise, the other group told them, look, the, the human makes the perfect slave, but what we'll do is we'll dumb down the human to the level of the machine, and then we'll have what we want. So don't wipe out the humans, you know, don't, don't need to get rid of them. You just lower their level of consciousness to the level of the robotoid or the cyborg. You work on the hive mentality. You condition them through the media and so forth and so on to get them to be darn on such a machine-like level that that is what creates the perfect slave. Their thinking, in other words, is mechanical. Their, emo you know, their emotional responses. And they're, they're basically working just like the average, you know, uh, uh, Cyberman is, is basically the object of the, of the game. Do, do you believe, Michael, that the swine flu is part of this manipulation, part of this control? Yeah, it's part of the whole uh, trepidation act. It's yeah. the same thing with, with, with uh, Al Gore and his whole biosphere, global warming, not malarkey. And it hits us on many fronts. And it's, uh, it's often where they take psychological content that we should be working on psychologically, and then they, what they do is they project it outward as to an outward trauma. And so there's a whole symbolism involved in this, a whole ritualistic, cultic thing going on when they introduce this fear. Because, of course, obviously, it's biological. If there's a flu or a disease out there, then we respond in a certain kind of emotional way to that, which actually lowers the immune system through anxiety. The whole, it's a feedback loop that you will get sick, not from the actual thing they're telling you you get sick from, but from the anxiety of imagining that there's, you know, some sort of monstrosity out there, or again, some unseen uh, epidemic 
this has an effect on the psyche because, as Jung said, all the real epidemics are human. They're all based in psychic epidemics, you know, uh, and, and they're able to manipulate this by constantly, you know, creating these uh, sort of um, ghouls and goblins to scare the bejesus out of us so that actually our, not only our moral foundations are destroyed, but even our biological immunity is reduced drastically. Why do people follow the Pied Piper? Why do they take that course? Well, I, I got a feeling that um, because the people who created these um, this dance, you know, are also experts. Let's give them that. They have some of the finest minds in the world. We can't fault them for that. They really do know their gig. And master they study man thoroughly. Yep. What's that? They're master manipulators. They're master manipulators. And then, as I said, it's because they have taken away... Remember, for every one negative teacher and for every, every, every negative or perverse ideology, there was a good one in its place. And that has been dumbed down, removed, and suppressed, which is a lot of the scholars and teachers that I work with in my work to try and help the world to know, you know, have been suppressed. You can't find their works. You can't find their books. Or we're programmed to believe, oh, it's very complicated to read these guys. Uh, it's, all, it's all pie in the sky stuff, when in fact it's incredible stuff. You know, that they've been mind-controlled into believing is very difficult and arduous, and, and they, all of these different uh, taboos have been put on it. And so, you know, and then remember, as you said earlier on, people have had the rug pulled so much from under them that their focus now is on only the most narcissistic and domestic sort of minutia that they can no longer even function to widen the horizon, to go down to a library, to browse a library, to, you know, go and research certain things or whatever, you know. So, again, the pressures of just daily life, you know, it, it can also be a big part of it. You, and, I, and I always tell people that email me or contact me is that, look, there are no shortcuts. You have to make the time. You have got to make the time. You've got to show the courage to go the distance, just like anything you love, you know. But you're not going to be able to do it out of fear, and you're not going to be able to do it if you're not able to manage your time and economize your time and fall in love with knowledge and fall in love with this process. That's a very vital thing. doubt everything, doubt what I'm saying, doubt what, you know, everyone says, find your own path, find your own road. Teachers can only be guides to you just like a signpost is, you know, we're not going to walk the road for you, this is the main thing. Too many people want to sort of territorialize this knowledge in the same way that you see a dog territorializing a lamppost. Well, that's not the way it works with knowledge. Each person must find their own light, and each person must, you know, get into that labyrinth and, and make the journey themselves. And I would say do it with an optimistic and very adventurous spirit like anybody would who was, you know, like Lewis and Clark did when they crossed the Rocky Mountains. You know, make it an adventure like you would a physical adventure. Is to really remember that in the end of the day, the only really true freedom that ever has existed on this planet is attitudinal. It exists in you. It's not something that really is a political thing in a way. If you really get down into the nitty-gritty of it, how can freedom ever really be bestowed? by any other agency except yourself. You know, some of the freest men have been locked up in prisons for very, very long times. Many of them have been even locked in dungeons, you know, in ancient times. Yet they were free because they were free in their mind. They're free in their consciousness. That can never be taken from anybody.